Welcome you this morning in behalf of the Calvary Church family and the family of Fred Stearns. Thank you for coming today. Your presence means a great deal to them. My name is Stan McFall and I serve as the senior adults pastor here at Calvary. And I had the joy of visiting with, praying with, singing with, laughing with Fred several times over the last three years. Here's an excerpt from one of my journal entries. Visited Fred Thursday, July 6th, 2017. Fred has been moved to uh, the Presbyterian homes at Johanna Shores, the Gables, last week. It was a good visit. I read the 23rd Psalm. He prayed, exclamation point. He got the first and last part's right. <laughs> if you have your service folder, look at the front. And there are two key words I want you to notice. They are the words celebration and thanksgiving. And that's what we're here to do this morning. We're here to celebrate the memory of Fred and to give thanks for his life. Now, please understand that funerals are for the living. They're not for the dead. And so this service is for you, for you as the family, for you, his friends. It's for us. For us to reflect on life and impact, to be among family and friends for comfort, and to see and to know God's peace and presence. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the man's life who we're celebrating today and giving thanks for his life and his legacy. And we pray that this might indeed be an honorable tribute to him and to his family. But Father, our focus is on you because Fred's life's focus was on you. And so our hope and prayer is that you will be glorified in this day as we look at your word, as we sing, as we listen to tributes, as we listen to amazing music. It's about you that we come together, but we want to celebrate and give thanks now. And we come together now in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Some bright morning when this life is over, I fly away, fly away to that old monk of celestial shore. I fly away, fly away, fly away. I fly away, fly away, oh glory, I fly away in the morning when I die. Fred's granddaughter. Um, one story I, would, I will always remember is the time when my grandpa would pray, play ping pong with me. He was such an amazing ping pong player, and I never won, but every point I could get was special to me. Whenever I won the point against my grandpa, I would run to the other side of the ping pong table and um, to a little chalkboard and put a tally down so I knew how many points I earned against him. My grandpa was always a kind, thoughtful man. I was always told by people that knew my grandpa that he was always a good man and that I was so lucky to have him as my grandpa. Those words were always so true. There was never a time when my grandpa, um, with my grandpa when I was not, was not smiling, laughing, and having a good time. Some other fun memories that I will always remember were many basketball games birthday sleepovers with my grandparents at my grandparents house and a little blue car my grandpa had um, this car was from Ukraine so it was really special to us uh, and this car has a story when my brothers and I were little my grandpa had this car and every time we went to my grandparents house we would run into my grandpa's room and ask him if he could get down the blue car this car was a little toy that would that you would push a button um, on the top of the car and it would start singing a song while the top would come down into a convertible and back up again. My grandpa would only let us push the button one time a day, but if we were good, maybe it was twice. <laughs> um, that little blue car brought so much joy to my siblings and I, also to my grandpa. My grandpa started to slowly go downhill and it was very hard for me. We eventually had to put him in the care center, and that was probably one of the hardest things I had to go through with my family. My grandpa never wanted that, um, that to happen, but it was best for him. I will never forget one day going to the care center knowing that he didn't know who I was. 
He then surprised me by saying my name and just smiling because I was there visiting him. He always had a contagious smile that I could never help but also smile. My grandpa was an amazing guy and one of the closest people to me, but I um, know that he is now in a better place watching me with God. He will forever be missed, and I will love my grandpa forever. Thank you. There are so many memories I could share about my dad and so many things he has taught me over the years that it's difficult to narrow it down to just a couple minutes. My dad was my role model and my best friend. He modeled every day what it meant to live for Jesus. Every morning when I got up, he would be at the kitchen table or at his desk with his Bible open, either reading or praying. He once showed me his prayer list so I could see how he prayed for me every day. He had his list broken up into the days of the week, and people's names were listed. There were relatives, friends, church leaders, government leaders, you name it. If he ever said, I will pray for you, you can bet you were somewhere on that list. So many memories have come to mind over the last few weeks. The trips we took to Seattle, just he and I were at the top. We would go every summer to visit his family, and we would do some work at his parents' house. Most of the time it had to do with yard work, since that was pretty difficult for them to do. Our reward for our hard work was a trip to the Space Needle at the end of the week to enjoy lunch together. We would marvel at the view of Puget Sound, all the different mountains, and he would even let me order fruit punch in a cup shaped like the Space Needle, which was terribly, ridiculously expensive, anyway. Another memory is being able to go to go for basketball games with him when his buddy he had season tickets with couldn't go. He was always pointing out what the players were doing on the court, but my attention was almost always focused on the cheerleaders. Our tradition was getting ice cream about two minutes before halftime, so we missed the big lines, and we were able to watch the halftime show because he knew how much I liked watching the cheerleaders. I will never forget when he told me I was finally old enough to go from an ice cream cone to a dish of ice cream. It was a big deal. My dad had a way of making even the everyday things very special. It didn't matter what we were doing. Our time together was always important. One thing he was never afraid to talk about was death. Not in a weird, morbid way, but he always told me that death was part of life. He said he wanted his funeral to be a celebration of his life. He didn't want people sitting around crying, but instead he wanted people sharing fun stories and laughing. That's one reason I'm not wearing typical funeral attire today, because it's in honor of his bright clothing choices sometimes, <laughs> such as his bright yellow pants that he liked to wear so much. <laughs> he never feared death, because he knew that he knew that he knew he would be with Jesus, where there would be no pain and no suffering. That's what he wanted to be celebrated. There's a song called Thank You that's about a man going to heaven and seeing different people who tell him how his life impacted their lives. There's a part of the song that's very fitting for my dad that I'd like to end with. One by one they came, far as the eye could see. Each life somehow touched by your generosity. Little things that you had done sacrifices made unnoticed on the earth in heaven now proclaimed i know up in heaven you're not supposed to cry but i'm almost sure there were tears in your eyes as jesus took your hand and you stood before the lord he said my child look around you great is your reward thank you dad for giving to the lord i'm definitely a life who is changed by your
my name is Jan, and I am the oldest nie of the niece and nephews of Fred, of 19 nieces and nephews on Theta's side. And although I'm going to be reading um, tributes from other people, I just wanted to share. Last night, um, my cousin Lisa and I were comparing stories about Uncle Fred was always such an encouraging person to all of his nieces and nephews. He really cared about your life, what was going on in your life. He looked you in his eye and asked you about what he talked to you about last time, the next time he saw you. And I can vouch for all of the nieces that when we would bring our new husbands into the family reunion, we'd say, now you're about to meet Uncle Fred, and with his handshake and his hug and his tickle, it's going to change your world. <laughs> Get ready. So I am reading a tribute on behalf of Kimberly Cuffs right now. I met Fred as a young child. He would come to dinner before going to the Gopher basketball games with my father, Dick Klaus. My brother and I would sit in the window watching for Fred's arrival. Shouts of, he's here, he's here, rang through the house as we saw the car headlights. Fred would fly through the front door, sit down at the piano to play a tune, and the race would be on. My brother and I anticipated when the tune would be over so we could get a head start as Fred chased us through the house. Squeals of joy would ring forth as my mother would plead with us to stop. The joy of Fred's arrival to our home never disappointed the two young children in residence. Fred and Theda bestowed upon me the highest honor of giving Carlin my name, Kimberly, as her middle name. My life has been forever enriched by the love and blessing given to me by Fred, Kimberly Klaus. Fred Cameron Stearns through the eyes of Richard Klaus. As I recall, I met Fred in 1960 when we both were teaching at North Elementary School in the North St. Paul Maplewood Oakdale School District. In 1962, we were involved in opening Harmony Elementary School. Fred and I had many things in common, so a friendship quickly grew. We started going to the U of M basketball games and did so until I stopped going in 2011. We usually parked on the street, so we had hundreds of hours of uninterrupted conversation as we rode and walked to and from Williams Arena. It was not always about basketball. What a gift. Early on, Fred would pick me up on the way to a game. This was something my two children looked forward to with much anticipation. My daughter Kimberly has explained this in her recollections, and my son Kendall agrees. During the 1960s, teachers were encouraged to take their class on field trips. One day after school, Fred stopped in my office and said he wanted to take his class on a field trip. I replied, great, where do you want to go? Fred replied, Chicago. <laughs> I, I don't remember what I said next, but I thought, have you lost your mind? <laughs> yes. For several years, Fred took his fifth grade to Chicago to visit the planetarium, the Museum of Science and Industry, along with experiencing the big city. On a Saturday morning, they flew on Northwest Airlines and returned home that same night, an experience most adults had not had, but Fred's fifth grade class had. Some of those students still maintained contact with Fred. Fred always wanted the best for all of his students. He had no time for teachers who were just putting in their time, not helping their students succeed. Over the years, the happy time spent with Theda, Carlin, and her children, and Fred are too numerous to count. In addition, the wonderful musical programs at Calvary and the men's chorus. On one of the last evenings Fred was with us, I had a feeling I should go over to see him. When I walked into his room, no one was there. Fida and Carlin had gone home after a long day with Fred. His music was playing softly, and he was resting so peacefully. For a second, I felt like an intruder. But then I felt that God had made it possible for us to have this time alone, as if we were on our way to a game. What a blessing from our gracious God. A far greater blessing is my almost 60-year friendship with Fred, then Theda, Carlin, and then her children. My name, <clears throat> I'm going to bring this up a little bit. My name is Don Rada, and a friend of 
Fred and Theta. And Theta has asked me to read a couple of tributes to Fred. The first is by Daryl Spildy, Fred's faithful and longtime friend. Daryl is a retired certified public accountant, and his words tell an exceptional, exceptional spiritual bond between two very close Christian friends. I will now read Daryl's tribute, and these are his words. I don't remember the first time I met Fred. It was a long time ago, and I'm sure it was in choir. I always tried to sit by Fred so I could listen to him and hear the notes for the tenor part, making it easier for me to learn the anthem we were singing. At some point, we discovered we both liked tennis, and that developed into a long-time adventure, getting together on Monday mornings when the weather allowed for a good tennis match. At first, Fred could beat me, more often than not. But as his eye problems continued, it became more difficult for him. Since Fred was very competitive, this was a source of frustration for him, but we continued to play until it came to the point where we had to give up playing tennis. We had been getting together for coffee during each winter season and continued to do that when we could no longer play tennis. Fred was good at making these transitions. The next one was harder on him. As his physical condition continued to deteriorate, he eventually had to give up driving. This loss of freedom was a real challenge for him and he soon accepted it as part of life. I would then drive and pick him up, and we would continue our weekly get-togethers. I learned quickly Fred enjoyed chocolate chip cookies at our McDonald's, and so coffee and cookies became part of our weekly adventures. Actually, I was the coffee drinker, and Fred was always having water. Being a school teacher, Fred would occasionally see former students and teachers he knew who would greet him warmly. I never heard Fred say anything negative about anyone. He enjoyed people. Fred made many trips to Ukraine, teaching in the schools. He was always trying to find a way to make a return trip, but it wasn't to be. Talking about friends he had made on those trips would sometimes bring tears to his eyes. Over the years, I learned a lot about his early life growing up in Washington State and his college experiences. He was a hard worker and knew how to overcome the challenges in his life. Another adjustment was on the horizon when getting around became harder for Fred. As I would help him in and out of McDonald's, he would tell me he never thought that he would be like this in old age. When we could no longer go to McDonald's together, I would go to his house where Theta would graciously provide the coffee and cookies, and then Fred and I would continue our weekly conversations. The last transition was hard on all of us. The increasing challenge of caring for Fred was taking its toll on Theta. She had to make the decision to have Fred enter Presbyterian homes. Our faith in Christ helped us to understand that God is in control and knows what he is doing. When I visited Fred there, I could usually get a response from him by mentioning something from the past. He loved talking about the Gophers basketball or hearing about the church choir. Sometimes we would sing old hymns and he would join right in, not missing a word. Our longtime adventure made another transition on July 20, 2019, when Fred entered his eternal home. Thanks, Fred, for a life well-lived and for allowing me to be a part of it. 
Daryl, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to hear your tribute. Your words illustrate a long-time friendship truly, truly blessed by God. This second tribute is mine, and I'll now, now read my tribute to Fred. Fred and I met and became very good friends late in our lifetimes. When we were formally introduced, it was about 15 years ago, I told Fred I remember seeing him back in the mid-1950s when we both worked evenings at 3M. During the daytime, Fred was in school at Bethel and I was at the University of Minnesota. When I mentioned this to Fred, he told me he didn't remember seeing me back then. It was obvious I didn't make an impression on him. <laughs> and I admired his honesty. At 3M, Fred worked for the billing department, and I worked in tabulation. Back then, we both worked with the IBM punch cards, and this was in the pre-computer, or what you young kids like to call the dinosaur age. <laughs> Honestly, I recall Fred as a young man with a broad smile and seemingly well-liked by all those around him. Fred's genuine concern for others and his friendly nature is what set him apart from the crowd. As we began to know each other better, we talked about the past, and I learned a lot about this man, which helped to confirm that positive impression he made on me over 60 years earlier. For example, one time Fred didn't have a ride back to Bethel, and he trudged from 3M on St. On Paul's east side back to school late at night in a snowstorm, freezing his feet in the process. And I understood from what he shared with me about his growing up years and early hardships. Those experiences no doubt helped shape the wonderful man we have come to know. Fred was a positive person. I never heard him say an unkind word about anyone. He didn't gossip. Fred was a good listener and an encourager. About two years ago, Theta and my wife Estelle attended a Bethel event while I spent that short time together with Fred at his home. I knew he loved music and I thought it would be helpful to bring my violin, which I was just learning to play. I played, <laughs> uh, you got it. <laughs> I actually played several hymns and then asked Fred if he had any suggestions to help my playing. After what was a really exceptionally long pause, Fred finally answered, don't play so fast. Well, two days after, it was during my violin lesson, the teacher told me, Don, slow down, don't play so fast, <laughs> which told me that playing fast doesn't always mean playing good. <laughs> and you know, Fred was a teacher right till the end. If I was to describe a mannerism of Fred's that stands out to me, it would be this. And those of you who knew him well will also recall him doing this. When Fred would hear someone say or do something that touched him deeply, he would tap his hand over his heart and say, Mercy, mercy. Throughout the Bible, we're told God judges our hearts. Fred's heart surely beat to the rhythm of God's love. I can envision Fred standing with Jesus, his Savior, and with his hand over his heart, and in holy awe, saying, Mercy, mercy. And I can envision Jesus saying, Well done, Fred, my good and faithful servant. Welcome home.
So let's continue to honor Fred and celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you please take that hymnal in the pew rack in front of you? Turn to hymn number 572. We will sing all verses of blessed assurance, and we will sing it with gusto and with joy. Let's stand together.
I'm Noah. I am the oldest grandson of Fred, and I would like to share a psalm or a couple of psalms uh, with you that I think describe my grandpa and his walk in his faith. Uh, psalm 95, 1 through 3. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us give a joyous shout to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Let us sing to him psalms of praise, for the Lord is a great God and a great, or the great king above all gods. Psalm 33, one. Let godly sing with joy to the Lord for it is fitting to praise him. Psalm 66, one through two. Shout joyful praises to God, all the earth. Sing about the glory of his name. Tell the world how glorious he is. Ephesians 5, 19 through 20. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among ourselves, making music to the Lord in our hearts and giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were reading from Fred's Bible, and it's a worn Bible because it was a well-used Bible. The grandkids read several passages from the book of Psalms. The book that follows Psalms is the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, were Fred's life verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. These are powerful words from God's word that have sustained and directed Christians for hundreds of years. And there are three things we can take away from these two verses that meant much to Fred. First, verse 5 begins with trust in the Lord. Will you say that with me? Trust in the Lord. Fred did this. And you have heard and read that faith was an integral part of Fred's life an important part of his legacy. Trust, it's an interesting word. It means to rely on. And the object of our reliance is the Lord. In Gill's exposition of the entire Bible, he notes that the center of our reliance, of our trust, is not in riches, or wisdom, or privilege, or education, or religion, or self. The object of our trust is in God alone. And Fred trusted God. He trusted in his providence. There's been several references to that already. Fred wrote this when he was 73. God has given us good times and hard times to teach us lessons. The story of Joseph takes up 13 chapters in the book of Genesis. And from his life and situation, God wanted us to understand some things about life and about him. And one of the things is his providence that comes out in these chapters. That God is at work 
at all times in the world. And I think if we are honest, that's hard to accept because we see lots wrong with the world and with us. But back to Joseph. He was the guy who was sold into slavery by his own brothers. He was the one who was accused falsely of seduction. He was the one that was placed in prison. And he was the one who sat in prison for years. The story does turn because he can interpret dreams. He gets in front of the Egyptian pharaoh and he interprets two dreams that this ruler had. And he gets out of prison and in the end is made the second highest in command of the kingdom. And you get to the last chapter of Genesis, chapter 50, and Joseph is talking with his brothers. The father has died. They're a little concerned about their own safety. These are the same ones who had years earlier sold him into slavery. And Joseph said this to them. You, you intended to harm me, but God... But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Joseph had discovered God's providence. And Fred, in his trust of God, understood God's activity in the world, both in the good and the not so good. And we need to do that. We need to do what Fred did during his life. Trust in God and in his providence. The second thing we see in Proverbs 3 from these verses that were his life verses is this. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Fred did this too. You have on the back of your service folder a snapshot of when and where his faith journey began. Faith, Fred acknowledged God as Father and Christ as his Savior. And this acknowledgement directed the trajectory of his life. He acknowledged God in all his ways. And the third thing from Proverbs 3 is a promise. There's a promise attached. Trust the Lord, acknowledge him, and then here it is. This promise he will make your paths straight. Now, what does this promise not say? It does not say that if you trust the Lord, if you acknowledge him, that you will never have any issues, that you will never have any problems, that you will never have any setbacks or hang-ups or letdowns. It does not say that. And Fred understood this. Again, from something he wrote when he was 73 and thinking about aging. It's tough getting old, isn't it? We don't have the strength to do everything we want to do. Some parts of our bodies don't work right. And there are always the aches and pains that bother us. Our handwriting gets shaky and our memory lapses increase. This promise does not mean that life will be smooth sailing from beginning to end. 
But what does it mean? What does it mean that God will make our path straight? It means that God will make plain that He will keep us from sin, that He will give direction to our destination. And that destination for Christ followers is what? It's heaven. I think from my journal entries, I counted some dozen times or so that I visited with Fred. And I noticed that in at least four times, I read or quoted in our visit Psalm 23. And I did that too on the last week of his life. I knelt by his bed and quietly whispered Psalm 23. Do do you remember how that chapter ends? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that is what Fred is doing now. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has set eternity in the heart of men. We were made for eternity. And death for Christian is the door from one side of life, the mortal one, to the next side of life, the immortal one. And because Fred trusted in the Lord. And because Fred acknowledged him in all of his ways, Fred is experiencing the final destinations of God's people. Heaven is now his eternal home. And now he's experiencing God in his glory. He's understanding his providence, and he's basking in his love. Fred's life verses. Let's follow what's laid out in them as he did. Let's trust in the Lord. Let's acknowledge him in all our ways. And let's hang on to that promise. He will make our path straight.